Hello and welcome to this um, episode of Fresh Start. Um, today I'm joined by Peter Burgess, who is the founding partner of Burgess Me Solicitors, which is a specialist um, family law firm. Um, and I know that Peter also specialises in mediation, which is what we're going to talk about today. And he has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. So, um, Peter, I think, well, firstly, welcome and thank you for agreeing thank you. to come on. And nice to be here. Um, I think it'd be really, really helpful for people to really understand exactly what mediation is and when it's appropriate to actually kind of engage in, because I think it's one of those things that gets talked about, but I think there's kind of a lot of, of kind of mystery around it. So it'd be great if you could just open up with cool. what it actually is involved. What is it? Okay, so mediation is um, one of the processes that can be used to resolve a whole myriad of different uh, types of issues and situations um, and there are four main sort of cornerstones of mediation uh, one is that it's confidential second is that it's voluntary you're making your own decisions about your situation uh, a third is that uh, the mediator um, basically provides information to the parties. And I'll explain a bit more about what that means in a minute. And the third is, uh, the fourth is, sorry, that it's not binding on either of either of the parties. But what it generally typically involves on the ground is a series of meetings. And the meetings usually start as one-to-one -one meetings. We call them intake meetings with each of the clients. They're usually about 45 minutes to an hour or so. And what happens at the intake sessions is that it's a confidential chat with the mediator. You would explain a little bit about your situation um, and the mediator will ask some questions, some questions and explain about the mediation process and how it works. And then there will be some checks to make sure that the case is suitable for mediation because not every scenario is. I mean, typically the questions that would be involved would be things around whether there's been any domestic abuse how you would feel about being in the same room as the other person, that sort of thing. If the case is then suitable for mediation, what then happens is the mediator will write to both parties and invite them to come to a joint session. And at the joint session, it can take a number of different formats on the ground. One is what I would refer to as the classic model of mediation. Um, and that involves both clients and a mediator in a room discussing things around the table together. You could also have what's called shuttle mediation, which is where you have the clients in different rooms and the mediator shuttles between them. And also there is the possibility of doing on it on Zoom or another video conference platform and the pandemic has really accelerated people's interest in doing that. It can be a good option if someone feels slightly uncomfortable being in the same room as the other person. And normally those sessions of mediation would be 90 minutes in length. Uh, can be longer, can be shorter. Sometimes the first one is a bit shorter. And if you're talking about dealing with uh, a divorce or separation, um, and dealing with, for example, finance and property issues, you're probably talking about maybe three or four sessions. If there are also children issues to discuss, it might be a bit longer, might be a few more than that. I mean, I have done sessions that have been uh, cases that have been much shorter. Um, and sometimes the parties, we'll talk about disclosure in a minute, but sometimes parties will come into mediation, having already done their disclosure. And that might mean that you don't need so many sessions. So the idea is that you would discuss things with your partner and the mere presence of a third party can make it easier and facilitate the discussion. The role of the mediator is not to tell you what you should do and give you individualized advice. The role of the mediator is to help the two of you to discuss it. And normally um, what that means is they provide a framework for the discussion so that I would identify the particular topics and I'd ask the right questions. Um, and we would work through a kind of collaborative agenda. That's really how it works in practice. 
Okay. And um, the mediator themselves, are they always legally trained? No, there are lawyer mediators and non-lawyer mediators, and some mediators come to it from different backgrounds. So sometimes you have therapist mediators, financial advisor mediators, and sometimes people who've done something else before or just trained as a mediator. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously a solicitor mediator, and I bring to my practice uh, as a mediator the experience that I have from negotiating um, and litigating uh, finance and children issues. Mm -hmm. family law issues and that can be helpful I think for clients um, coming into the process to know that they're they've got someone who's probably seen or done cases that are similar to theirs before yeah and are you able to um kind of show what an outcome could be if they did go to court versus if the mediation didn't work so what kind of the scenarios would be coming out of yeah. that mediation? it's a really good question um the answer to that is, uh, as a mediator, there, there's a fine line between the provision of information and the provision of advice. And it sounds like, well, that sounds very similar. But actually, information is generally something that you could Google if you knew what to put into the search bar. Advice is something that you couldn't Google. So you couldn't, you couldn't Google, shall I accept his offer and get an answer out? But what you could do is Google, what are the factors the court takes into account? If they're inherited assets and you'd probably find an article so that is an illustrative example of the difference between information and advice and your question is about could i tell the, the clients as a mediator um you know what the range of outcomes would be i can tell them if they're outside the range and i can tell them what factors the court takes into account um, but what I can't do is tell them where they are within that band of outcomes. I can't say, Mr. Bloggs, you're being too mean and you need to pay her an extra £10,000 a year, yeah. even though I probably have an idea in my head of what that might look like. But what I could do is say, well, let's take a step back and look at Mrs. Bloggs' expenditure and work out whether or not what you're providing for her is going to be sufficient for her to meet her needs. And then let's look, for example, at what Mr. Bloggs would be left with if he was to pay her a bit more to cover any shortfall. So as a mediator, your role is to help the parties to reality test any, any um, discussions they have um, with the idea that, of trying to end up somewhere in the range of fair outcomes. Mm -hmm. and, and so the idea of mediation is really to try and get to that point of settlement sooner and in a more collaborative way do they bring their yep. solicitors to the mediation or do they attend on their own the classic model they're a bit like colas actually so the classic cola is you don't bring your lawyer with you okay. um but uh sometimes it can be helpful to have lawyers there i mean normally what happens is the, the sessions are spaced out two or three weeks apart if the if it's a finance and property case and they haven't done their disclosure, they might need longer between session one, joint session one and joint session two, because they've got to do all the disclosure exercise. But normally they're a couple of weeks apart. And the idea behind that is it gives them the opportunity to reflect on what they've discussed and to speak to their solicitors if they have one. You don't need a solicitor, but if you choose to have one in the background, to talk to them about what they've discussed in mediation. Mm -hmm. And I will also after every session, give them a summary of what we talked about. And at the end, I will set them any homework that they have. So for example, I might say to them, uh, go and ask your lawyer what your best outcome, your worst outcome, and what the midpoint of the range is of outcomes on this issue. Or I might say, each of you should bring to the next session five examples of properties you think are suitable for the other party and the children to live in. And, um, so they have the opportunity to take advice in between. If we reach an impasse, that's to say, Mr. Bloggs is here, Mrs. Bloggs is there, and they won't meet in the middle, I might suggest that they bring their lawyers. Sometimes people can be a bit uh, reticent to move because they're worried that they're going to ring their lawyer afterwards and say to them, well, I moved to here. And the lawyer might say, why did you move there? That was a stupid idea. So sometimes having the lawyers in the room even though they don't actively participate in the mediation, can be a useful way of uh, empowering people to make the decisions that they find it too difficult to make otherwise. Yeah, 
And you mentioned as well that you don't have to have a lawyer. So you can no. just mediation process without you know solicitors involved obviously I know that there is the legal process of physically you know getting divorced yeah but, but in the sense of mediation it's not it's not crucial to have a solicitor in the kind of in the background it's not crucial but um the lawyer's caveat was always coming at, after the start of that sentence but <laughs> I would say it's usually advisable mm -hmm. um for you to have at least an idea. I mean, when you mediate, you're mediating in the shadow of what a court would do. Mm -hmm. So as a mediator, I will say, these are the things the court might look at. These are the options the court might have. Um, and I suppose if you're in that scenario and the mediator is saying these things to you, you kind of probably want to know how the law would apply to your situation. So I will usually recommend that the parties take advice at some point in the process. And it's probably a good idea to go into the process with some kind of idea of what the sort of parameters for engagement will be and what the parameters for settlement might be. It might be very difficult to do that if, for example, Mrs. Bloggs has no idea how many bank accounts Mr. Bloggs has or how many properties he owns or what the mortgage is. It's going to be quite difficult for Mrs. Bloggs' solicitor to figure out what, what an acceptable outcome might look like. Um, so usually there will come a point where the parties have uh, worked up between them a set of proposals. Those proposals are not binding on them. But I will always say to them at that point, you should take some advice on these proposals and um, try to come up with, uh, you know, try to get the advice to make sure that you're happy with them. Mm -hmm. And if you've acted in the in the role as a mediator, are you able to work with either client going forward, or does that? No. Mean? So I, I, when clients speak to me first off, sometimes they ring me up and they say, "I don't know whether I want you as a mediator or as a solicitor," and I have to explain that I can only wear one hat because mm -hmm. the mediator um, is neutral. That's one of the cornerstones principles of mediation. So I can't be, I can't be. In, I can't wear two hats, no. um, is what I'll usually say. Um, but I will refer them to um, a colleague, not in my firm, but one of my peers at another firm who I've worked with before and who would be able to give them the advice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when and we, we touched on at the beginning about the different types of mediation, so sort of taking your analogy of cola bottles, the kind of the class yeah. of they're both in the room, but then also the shuttling or, or Zoom. Does yeah. the, um, do you see different outcomes depending on the process um, or kind of, and what, what would you decide, what would decide whether that should be a shuttle versus both getting in the room? Well, sometimes geography is an issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't do that much video conferencing before the pandemic, um, but I would say about half my mediations are now on Zoom or maybe even more than half. Um, because it does lend itself quite well to that. And, and it means that you can do uh, you can do a shuttle mediation more easily because you can put them in separate rooms. Um, but shuttle on Zoom, uh, and if the issues are not narrow, so if you're not just debating whether little Johnny is going to go to dad or mum on a Thursday, mm -hmm. and you're trying to do the whole case shuttle Zoom, I think it doesn't really work. It's just this you lose so much by not having people in the same room and not even in the same building, mm. I think it becomes very difficult to do that. Um, whether it's in person or on Zoom, um, if we're all in the same room, I don't think it matters that much, um, but that might be controversial because actually a lot of mediators would say part of the benefit of what you get from doing it in person is it's easier to read body language and there is more of a roll the sleeves up and get this done type attitude if you're all in the one place. But having said that, lots of my clients work and they work in the city and we have three offices in London, in the London area. Um, but it's actually easier for them to just hop onto a Zoom call, you know, to wolf their sandwich in the first five minutes and then hop onto a Zoom call on their lunch break to have that discussion. I would say, um, people need to be in the right frame of mind to do it because it can be quite hard work um, for the mediator and for the clients uh, 
to actually have that conversation sometimes is very difficult. Mm. So what is the kind of right conversation to be, you know, if you're considering mediation, you don't know whether it's for you, you know, what is the right way to approach mediation? How do you make that decision as to whether you think that this would be a good option? What would you, what would your advice be? Well, if you're, uh, drifting a, a couple who's drifted apart um, if there are no children and if you've got quite straightforward assets um, and you just sort of want someone to help you to come to a deal that's an ideal place to have a, to start with mediation um, if it's very very hostile and there are lots of issues or there's an or there's some abuse being alleged it's probably not going to be inappropriate and then obviously there are a whole myriad cases in the middle that might be appropriate. I would say um, one of the things that I look out for as a mediator is there gonna be a power imbalance between the parties. It's not necessarily a barrier to mediation that one person sort of has all the financial information and the other person doesn't. Um, but if there are disclosure related issues, mediation might not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm a great believer in it as a, as a process. I think it's really good and it's very flexible. And usually there is a way of being able to uh, flex the process to suit the situation. But I mean, there are some absolute barriers. So for example, if one person feels, if I ask them this question in the intake session, how would you feel about being in a room with your uh, former partner? And they say, well, I would hate it. And I just would feel totally paralyzed mediation might not be the right format because you're going to have a session where they, they're sitting in front of me and one of them is talking, the other one is literally looking the other way or looking at the floor. Mm. It's not going to work. No. And what about in the situation where you have children? Um, is it, I, I, I've come across mediation being quite, you know, used quite a lot when it's coming to agreeing kind of the, the, the arrangement for children. And yeah. um, I think um, something that uh, we covered a few weeks back with um, Samantha Woodham is the fact that actually, you know, courts don't like to make decisions on children. They think the best place is for the parents to make that decision. And obviously mediation naturally lends itself as a place to do that and agree that. Yeah. So, and what does that look like? Um, it looks like, uh, I mean, it is really good for discussing um, children issues, you're absolutely right. Um, I think uh, there are there is the option of doing what's called child inclusive mediation, which is where the child doesn't come to the mediation session. Um, instead, what would happen is a mediator um, or the mediator, because um, sometimes you might use an external person to do it would um, discuss with the parent the idea that the child might be consulted about uh, what they think and what they're feeling. Um, and um, those views, if the parents agree and the child agrees, can be elicited from the child and then fed back into the mediation process. Um, however, uh, it is sometimes the case the child might say, well, this is how I'm feeling, but I don't actually want you to tell my mom and dad. Um, and in those circumstances, sometimes you feed back to the parents and say, well, Johnny didn't, you know, I had a good chat with Johnny, but I haven't got anything to feed back. So it's very, that aspect is quite driven by um, what the child thinks. But I mean, I think with, with um, child inclusive mediation, it's not going to be appropriate in every case. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that age is a factor there. Um, it's more likely to be appropriate with teenagers than it is younger children. Um, I myself, um, I was going to train actually during the pandemic, but then the pandemic happened and um, the course was deferred. But I have done it before with a co-mediator, a therapist who I co-mediate with, and she sees children individually in her own right as a counsellor. Um, and it's very effective, actually, um, in bringing to the attention of parents, you know, how a child is feeling, being stuck in the middle. Mm. Um, but um, it's not appropriate in every case. And I think the majority of cases, um, probably you find the parents just discussing between themselves what the arrangements will look like. Mm -hmm. And then the outcome of that arrangement, that's the parenting plan is it, that they kind of agree to. Yes. Yeah, and they can agree whether the parenting plan, which is sort of, uh, 
a document written in plain English which records the outcomes and the principles of how they're going to parent um, and records things like time split, education plan, health, um, and then things like ground rules like screen time and so on. Mm -hmm. It's a really, really useful thing for parents to do. Um, and that document can be what's called without prejudice or it can be open. The difference between the two is without prejudice parenting plan couldn't be referred to in, theoretically couldn't be referred to in court proceedings. Um, an open one could be later on referred to. There is some debate among mediators and lawyers about whether it whether that's a distinction which is actually uh, the case on the ground, because the court has an overriding uh, power to intervene in the interests of um, child welfare. So um, that's a sort of very technical argument that's as yet unresolved. But what your clients will need to know is. Um, I usually recommend a parenting plan. I think they're really good. And I think they can be a really useful basis for things like ground rules um, of everything really, but ground rules in particular. And that's something that I would cover. Quite often I'll do a session early on in the mediation process if they have kids and if they want to do it, where we just deal with ground rules. Um, mm -hmm. And a parenting plan is a really good way of recording the outcomes from that session. Brilliant. And what are the expected outcomes of a mediation gone well? What is the outcome that, you know, that you're trying to work to with the, the two clients? Yeah. OK, so um, there are two documents which are produced called the outcome documents. Um, and uh, the first is called the open financial statement. And that's basically a document that records and sets out um, what the finances look like. And the second is called the Memorandum of Understanding. The Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, is a without prejudice document, and I'll explain what that means again in a minute, which records the discussions and the outcomes and the proposals that they've made to each other across a variety of issues. It's without prejudice because it, that can't be referred to in any later court proceedings. So if they walk away from the proposals that they've made, and then they end up in court, they can't refer back to that document. They can refer to the open financial statement, but they can't refer back to the MOU. And so the next step would be they go away and they have time to reflect and take advice. And if they like the proposals and want to stick with them, then they would then be turned into a court order that deals with financial issues. As Sam may have explained, um, it's quite unusual to have a court order in relation to children issues mm -hmm. emanating from mediation. You typically wouldn't have mm -hmm. a court order because the court proceeds on the basis of the parents should be the ones to agree what the arrangements look like. Yeah, but this is the step to avoiding court. Um, Correct. To get to the point where you both agree um, Correct. For the, and for the children, then you don't ever have to step foot in court, which is the exact conversation that I was having with Sam is okay. why, what it is, what it actually means to go to court and why you should try and avoid it at all costs yeah. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and do the alternative. So this is, you know, this is one of the alternatives. And actually, you can't start a court process now without having gone to see a mediator unless you fall into one of the accepted categories things like extreme hardship or injustice or urgency or you've been a victim of domestic abuse uh, or you've gone to a session with a mediator and decided that mediation isn't appropriate so it's now a sort of the funnel through which all court applications are made is through the mediation process which is brilliant, actually, because it's, it, it highlights again the fact that actually courts don't want you to end up there. And it is the last stop. It's not the first. You know, I think there's a massive misconception of because we see it on TV and we see it in the media play out that, you know, you get divorced, you go to court. But actually, that's the last result. And there's a uh, last result, I should say. And that actually there's there are steps along that journey to try and get to a much more amicable um, decision a lot quicker for everyone involved. And increasingly... I'm sure Sam will have covered this in her session. The courts are not a good place to resolve any dispute because uh, the outcomes are so variable and the cost of going through a court process, the emotional cost as well as financial cost, um, is very significant. Yeah. 
And actually on the, the subject of cost, what do mm. you know, what does the cost look like in the sense of mediation and how does that yeah. impact the overall costs of the divorce? Uh, well, each mediator will have their own way of charging, but usually the mediators will charge on the basis of the amount of time spent. Um, and as a mediator, I charge slightly differently to how I charge as a solicitor because as a solicitor, I charge for everything I do on the file um, in units um, of an hour. Um, and as a mediator, I only actually charge for the time that's in the, I spend in the session or the time before and after prepping or preparing uh, the outcome documents. So emails and calls and things in between, I don't generally charge for. Um, but yeah, it's normally a topic of discussion in the intake and first sessions will be who's going to pay and how is it going to be divided. Lots of people will pay out of their joint account if they're going through a divorce and say, well, we'll just put it put it on a you know on the joint joint credit card or joint account. Um, sometimes if one party wants to go to mediation and the other person is a bit more reluctant, one person might say, well, I'll, I'll pay. So you don't have to do anything. You just have to turn up. Um, and, but it's, it's usually something that you would thrash out, uh, in the intake sessions or in the first joint session. Do you think who's paying has an impact on the mindset in which people enter mediation? Um, I mean, I normally reassure them that it doesn't really matter who pays. It's just that it's an expense that somebody has to meet. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can be quite useful to, if someone is a bit reluctant for the other person to say, you know, this is a process that we have to go through. If we don't go through this process, then we might end up in court. Mm -hmm. I've got to go and see the mediator anyway before I go to court. So why don't we just make use of the session to come along and I'll pay for it? That could be quite a forceful and persuasive argument for getting someone into mediation. Um, but ultimately, because it's voluntary, um, I mean, when the when the reforms to family law and the cuts to legal aid and for family law came in almost ten years ago now, um, the government decided that mediation was going to be the gateway and everybody should go to mediation. But it isn't appropriate in every case. Um, it's not a panacea that resolves all issues, but it is really good and it's probably worth considering. It's one of the things that when a client comes to see me as a solicitor and says, how should I resolve this? It's one of the first things that we'll talk about is, well, could you go to mediation? What might that look like? You know, how would you feel about it? Um, what are the alternatives to mediation? Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you ever see couples after um, the divorce has been finalized and they have maybe an update to their parenting plan, for example, do they tend to come back to mediation or do you find they that? They do actually, yeah, they do. Okay. And um, I've, I've had, I've got a few clients who come back and see me periodically if they're having an issue. And actually I had one during the pandemic where they came, they'd been to see me a few years prior and then they came back to me because there was an issue related to uh, new partners and uh, COVID um, related issues blending families and people mixing and so on um and yeah it was it was good actually it worked really well because it's such a, a flexible medium and you can do it in a variety of different ways and if they've already worked with one mediator it's quite helpful to be able to come back and work with that person again brilliant so actually it is something that can be used not just in the sense of a separation or divorce but it's actually a really good tool to use in the sense of just managing that relationship going forward and as you say when you when things crop up it's still available it's still an option to you because I think a lot of people don't, don't associate that as well they think it's just for you know thrashing it out before going to court kind of thing so it's really helpful to know and um, so your yep. top tips for kind of someone who's considering mediation um, just to sort of summarize. Top tips. Okay. Um, have a think about getting some advice alongside mediation. I think that is really important. Um, have a think about how it's going to feel being in the same room as the other person. Um, I think preparing the way for mediation is also really helpful. Perhaps um, looking at a few mediators, maybe speaking to them. I'm always, hap I'm always happy to feel the call from someone who wants to consider it. Um, and, 
Yeah, I mean, I think expectation setting as well. So understanding that it might it might not be the thing which resolves your case, but I think it's a very good start a long way. And because you're only paying, certainly in the classic model, for one professional to do the majority of the work and the handholding, it can be a really cost-effective way of resolving the dispute as well. So um, I commend it to your viewers as being definitely something to consider right at the, at the beginning of the process. And as you say, you know, at any point. Mm. Yeah, especially if you've built a relationship with that particular mediator, they know your story, et cetera. I think that's yeah. really helpful to not have to, you know, go through that, oh, this is who we are and how our family works. And that can be, if you've got that background already, then that's obviously really yeah. helpful the family and getting the right the right outcome that's really helpful yeah. I think you know that it's, right. it is is really good to know and especially as you say I think people don't realize that actually it is the funnel into court and um picking up from from our last conversation that we have with Sam which is something that you should try and avoid and this is a really really good option if you know not for everyone but for, for those that it is and um, thank you so much Peter You're for very welcome your, your knowledge and experience with us um, and I know that actually we're going to try and arrange for another session to do a Q&A um, and I'm sure conversations and questions will come up about mediation as well so thank you very okay. much for your time all right thank you bye